In this video, we're going to go over some of the different process analysis and design tools that we can use when determining if our process is helping us to match the design that we have for our company's competitive advantage. So if we're trying to have an organization that focuses on differentiation, quick response, low cost strategy, whatever it may be, um, we're going to analyze and then learn how to design process strategies that match our competitive advantage. So when analyzing and designing a process, we need to ask ourselves, is this process designed to achieve competitive advantage? Does it eliminate steps that don't add value? Does this maximize the customer value as perceived by that customer? And will this process help me to win orders? Those are four key questions to ask when we're designing processes within our organizations. To help us understand what our current process is and where there can be opportunities for improvement, we're going to look at a couple different process analysis and design tools. And those tools are flowcharts, time function mapping, value stream mapping, process charts, and service blueprinting. So flowcharts are providing us with a big picture of a process. Time function mapping adds rigor and a time element to a flowchart. Value stream analysis extends the, uh, the time function map, and then it adds in the customer and or the vendors. And then a process chart shows detail of all the various steps within a process, whether they add value or do not add value. And then a service blueprint focuses on what parts of that service process have customer interaction. So we're gonna talk about all these different design tools uh, over the next couple slides. So you have all seen this by now. A flowchart uh, shows the movement of materials. Um, and in addition to materials, it can also show the movement uh, of people and or processes. Um, so um, really, when you see this very simplistic flowchart tool, it's, it's widely used, um, even though it's extremely simple. It's probably used so much because it's extremely simple. And it tells us the movement of materials, people, and products, and, and whatever else. Also, it can show us whether um, within a process, uh, what is a action or a decision to be made in that process. So generally squares or rectangles are actions, decisions are triangles, and then um, you work your way through a process with all these different uh, rectangles and triangles to see what your process is, where there's any um, decisions that need to be made in that process. And it's really helpful that um, it's all laid out uh, step by step within that process. What's step one? What's step two? What's step three? What's step four? And that's what a, a flowchart helps you to visualize. A time function map or a process map uh, shows the flows and the time frame uh, for your process. So you can see in the example on the screen that this time function map is a before picture of what a process was like before they made some improvements to it. You can see at the very bottom that this process took 52 days to complete. So the time function mapping, it, it shows all the times for every single step, um, even if that step is just sitting and waiting for something. So um, like we're gonna talk about, or like we've already talked about in chapter 16 on Lean, maybe this is a great example for a Kaizen event. And a Kaizen event is where you're going to look at all the steps in a process, determine which ones are non-value added versus a value added, and see which steps can be either eliminated or improved upon in that journey of continuous process improvement. So this is a great example of a process that could use a little bit of improvement. If you look at these first couple steps between your ordering process and waiting for production control, you have a total of 25 days worth of a 52-day process uh, to get this product um, uh, ordered and then received by your customer. And you can see there's a whole bunch of wait times in this process between waiting in the warehouse for 10 days, uh, waiting in the warehouse for four days, waiting in production control for 13 days. So you add up all of those and that's a lot of wait time uh, in this process. So this is a before picture. You can see here after they did the analysis and they determined which steps were value added versus non-value added and they found ways to either eliminate steps or improve them that they were able to improve this process down to six days so it went from 52 days to six days um, it's a savings of 46 days it, honestly it's not that uncommon 
to be able to dramatically reduce the lead time uh, to your customers when you look at your own internal processes by looking at all the steps it takes from the time you receive an order to ship an order to your customer. There's a whole bunch of non-value added activities and steps and wait times and setup times and just uh, individual processes that can be improved. So you can generally improve your uh, customer lead time by looking at your internal processes and making those improvements. So a time function map or a process map is one of those tools to help you improve your process design. Another um, example of a process design tool is a value stream map. This takes the uh, time function map, but it also adds your external supply chain. It can add your customers. It shows the flows and time and value added beyond your immediate organization. And so in this example, you can see it's including the supplier. It's including deliveries. It shows how much time on the top is non-value added activities, whether that's waiting or shipping. And then at the very bottom, how much time is value added. So for, for, this, um, for this product that's taking weeks to get delivered, there's only 140 seconds of value added activities um, in, this, in the manufacturing of this product. So there's a lot of um, non-value added activities that can be addressed and ideally removed or improved uh, for, this, for this process. So this is a value stream map. It shows value added beyond the immediate organization, including customers or uh, suppliers. And you know, with both the time function map and the value stream map, sometimes it just makes you look at things a little bit different. Here's uh, an example I like to use. I love football, so don't get me wrong. Football is awesome. Um, I love, well, I just love football. I love watching the games. I loved football more when the Chargers were in San Diego. But a typical football game takes three and a half hours. Three and a half hours, okay? And if you're watching it on TV, you see the coin flip. You see the cheerleaders. You hear, you know, the announcers talk about game strategy. They, you know, uh, move the camera over to the head coach and they see him pacing along the sideline. Then there's the kickoff. Then there's a commercial. Then there's the first play of the game. Then there's a commercial. And it's three and a half hours long for a football game. Well, the actual game itself is 10 minutes. So if you ever um, watch the NFL channel and you see the you only watch the plays, a game takes about 10 minutes. So that means in a football game, there's 320 minutes of non-value added activities where they're not playing the game. So you can, you can do these time function uh, maps and these process flow charts and these value stream maps and uh, you can look at everything in a different manner if you would like um, to see what is value added versus non-value added and how that process can be improved. Another uh, design tool uh, to help in looking at uh, process designs and analyzing those processes is a process chart. It uses symbols to show the key activities and so for this example, which is the hamburger assembly process, if you look down at the bottom, the circle is operations, the arrow is transportation, the squares are inspection, the D equals delay, and the upside down triangle equals storage. So they've got all these different symbols and every single step in that process gets classified as either an operation, transportation, inspection, delay, and storage. And the only thing that's determined as a not as a value added activity are the operations. Operations are the only ones that are considered value added activities. No one cares about the time it takes for transportation. I don't want to wait while they're moving stuff around in a hamburger uh, factory. Um, I don't want to wait for them to inspect the order. I want them to build quality into their process so they don't have to inspect it. I don't want there to be storage delays or just any other kind of administrative delay. So the only value added activities are when they're building that hamburger, which is the circle. And so you add up all of the totals for non-value added versus value added activities. And for a hamburger assembly process where the significant portion of it is on the broiler at two and a half minutes out of a total of 303 minutes and 15 seconds, 86% of this process is value added. That makes sense. A hamburger is kind of fast food. There's not a whole lot of wait time there. If you think about Chipotle or Subway or some of these other facilities that are making food for you, it's a pretty quick process. It's a lot of value added time making uh, the output, which is that, um, that burger or that burrito or whatever it is that you're going to eat. 
there's not a whole lot of wasted time in that process from start to finish for you, the customer. So a process uh, chart shows the symbols and all the key activities in a process. Okay, now let's talk about service blueprinting. Service blueprinting is a process analysis technique that lends itself to focus on the customer and the provider's interaction with that customer. So if you are a service firm, you interact with customers, you need to understand where the different levels are between when you're interacting with them, when you're not interacting with them, and then when you um, uh, have them leave your facility. It's the same for a restaurant, an oil change, whether you're getting a haircut, it doesn't matter. With a service firm, there are different uh, points where you're interacting with them, those moments of truth that we talked about earlier, to where not only do you wanna create processes where your customer is delighted, but also you wanna build quality into your process so that you don't make errors, okay? I think I used this example before, but I got my oil changed a couple weeks ago, and they had this checklist that they followed methodically to make sure that everything was done correctly, that my, my wipers were on, my oil cap was back on, that my tires were back on, because I had them rotate my tires, and that they were at the right PSI, and they verbally were communicating with each other, they all had checklists, they had different poke yokes in process to make sure that there was no mistakes in that process. Um, so, oh, poke yoke, bottom of the screen. A poke yoke is literally translated as foolproof. It's a procedure that blocks the inevitable mistakes from becoming a defect. So you can build poke yokes into your service process just like you can for a manufacturing process. So service blueprinting, there's three levels of customer interaction. Level one, where the customer is in control. They walk into the facility, they see if they want to stay and let you perform whatever kind of service you are there for, whether it's a haircut, oil change, fast food, whatever it may be. Level two, the customer may interact with the service provider, um, but that's generally when the service is being performed. And then level three is the service is removed from the customer's control and the interaction, and now the service firm is doing what they're supposed to be doing, whether it's an oil change or cutting your hair, they are now um, in control of that process. So each level has its different managerial issues and you need to work through those. Uh, so let's just show an example real quick. Um, and we can just use um, uh, an oil change as an example again. So on the far left, the customer arrives and they arrive for some kind of service. That's level one, they're in control. They haven't decided to let you perform any kind of service on their car. So uh, the first pokey yoke, that F1 that you see, that could be a bell on the door just to notify your employees that someone is literally there. So you can physically go and talk to them and welcome them into your facility. Then level two, so now you and the customer are interacting. You're talking about what is their request? What are they there for? Can you, can you provide the service that they need? So if they need an oil change, then great, they're at the right place. If they need an engine repair, you probably gotta tell them they gotta go somewhere else. So let's say it's an oil change, you then give them a quote. So F2 is hand them a quote, make, have them sign it so that they know what their invoice is going to be so they don't get upset later and surprised about a bill. Then you can say, thank you for you know, approving this, this, um, this tentative bill. Why don't you have a seat in our waiting room? You know, we've got a football game on. And by the way, would you like some coffee or water? So that would be your third pokey yoke. Provide them with something um, that makes them feel comfortable while they are in that waiting room. And you want that service encounter to be warm and friendly and that you've met all of their needs. So all of, all of this in the level two section is you're greeting them, you're uh, engaged with them so that um, uh, you can find out if you're gonna actually perform the service for them. And then after they agree that they want that service performed, then it goes down to level three, the customer sitting in the waiting room and the oil change facility is off doing their thing. So I, I know I just gave an example where I was in the car, but that doesn't always happen that way, right? So you can get an oil change and be sitting in a waiting room while they're doing whatever kind of work they need on your car and it's over in the shop. It just so happened in the example I just used where I was in my car while they performed that oil change. So in the example on the screen of this facility, you're in the waiting room, they are in complete control because they are now performing the service on your car. You don't generally see the work that they're doing 
And then once they are done, they come back and they notify you that it's uh, the car is almost ready. You then look at your, your final bill, you approve it again, you hand them your credit card, they say thank you for leaving or thank you for your business and then you leave. And so this is a service blueprint. You would walk through that process with your team. You walk through all the steps that are happening within your facility and you can add or remove steps that are currently in the process to make sure you are matching your organizational strategy and that your uh, customers are um, happy with the service that you're providing. So this is a service blueprint. So there's some special considerations for a service process and service design. Some interaction with the customer is necessary, but often it also affects performance um, adversely. You, you maybe don't always want to have interactions with your customers because maybe it will slow down your service. The better these interactions are accommodated in the process design, the more efficient and effective that process is. Finding the right combination of cost and customer interaction using a service process matrix, which we'll go over next, is critical. You might want to have some kind of mass, mass service or professional service, or you might want to be a service factory or a service shop. So finding that right mix in your process uh, matrix is critical. And again, you might have different processes and levels of customer interaction based off of what the customer wants. So if you look at this service process matrix, you've got your degree of customization on the top. So low customization versus high customization. And then on the left, you've got your degree of labor interaction. You've got low at the bottom and high at the top. So if you look at something that's high in the degree of labor and high in the degree of customization, you've got private banking, you've got a law firm, you've got my uh, orthodontist who knows my teeth specifically with all the braces that I had as a child. So these are professional services. They know um, exactly what you want and there's a high degree of customization specifically for you. And that also requires a reasonable amount of direct labor uh, that's going to cater to you. I have an orthodontist. I have a lawyer. I have a banker. And they all know me and they know, um, you know, for, for banking, for instance, they know my level of risk. They know my long-term goals. Uh, my orthodontist knows exactly how I wanted my teeth. Uh, and, and my lawyer knows exactly how I wanted my trust set up and my will and things like that. So that is the high customization and high labor. Now, as you go over to the um, uh, lower degree of customization, take commercial banking, for example. Here, here's, a, here's a perfect example of how I use Bank of America as my commercial banker. They have my checking account and my savings account. And so when I want to deposit a check, I just deposit a check and I don't talk to anyone at Bank of America to do so. And they don't want me to talk to them either. They just want my money in their account. So that's a lower level of customization and a lower level of labor. So it's not customized to me because everyone deposits checks exactly the same way. Now, I also go through Bank of America for my private banking. So that's a very different ballgame. I've got a broker who I work with. He knows about my kids' college funds. He oversees my 401ks and my mutual funds. And we talk every couple weeks about how the stock market's doing, how my mutual funds are doing, if we need to make any changes or if we just keep things as is. But we have a private, or we have a personal relationship and he's my private banker. But I use the same firm for both. One just has a much higher level of customization than another. Same thing for, for um, uh, let's talk about um, uh, restaurants. So a service shop is a fine dining restaurant. There's a high degree of customization. There's a little bit more labor involved there as well. On the far left is a service factory. There's not as much customization uh, because, you know, you're going to, in a fast food restaurant, there's just not as many options. I mean, think about, um, think about your standard fast food restaurant versus like a cheesecake factory where pretty much everything's custom made. Right? You can get Mexican, you can get Italian, you can get American, whatever kinds of food you know you want for that day, there's everything in there. A fast food restaurant has a, a specialty that they focus on and so it's not as customized. You can't go to Sombrero's and ask for um, spaghetti. They don't offer it. 
So anyway, that's your service process matrix. Again, you've got to really think through where your firm full falls in this matrix and make sure you're designing processes that align with that. And so um, there are techniques for improving uh, productivity in the service sector. If you don't want to be highly customized and you don't want a high degree of labor, there are ways to improve service productivity. So think about self-service, for example. Self-service uh, is so customers examine things, compare them, evaluate them at their own pace. An example of self-service and how that's improved service productivity is now when you go to the supermarket, you can, you can check yourself out. So not only can you take your sweet time walking through the the, the um, supermarket, you also just literally check yourself out. So that's a way that supermarkets have become more productive because they don't have people who are, you know, helping you in the aisles and then checking you out every time. So self-service has made them more productive. Uh, focus would be an example of uh, like in a fast food restaurant, like I just explained, um, you're actually restricting the amount of offerings that you have. So your employees are going to be more productive because they're, they're building a limited scope of products, whereas a full service restaurant uh, is, is going to be less productive because there's more options. Um, one more example might be um, automation. So automation, uh, separating service that may lend uh, themselves to some type of automation, like an ATM. Um, I, I mean, I remember the days when I used to uh, go to a bank and I'd have to park my car and I'd have to walk inside and I have to wait in line in a queue. Um, I would have a teller who'd check my ID they would deposit the check into my account. They would stamp the check. And then a few days later, I would, um, I'd have the money in my account. Well, then they got ATM machines, right? Great. So now I can still drive up and I, at least I don't have to talk to anyone. I can just walk over to the ATM machine and put my check in that way. So that was more automated than having to talk to a teller. Well, take it one step further. And now I just deposit checks from my phone. I, I haven't been to a bank in forever. So that is more automated and therefore they're improving service productivity. They don't see me, I don't see them, the money just miraculously shows up in my account. That's great, that is a service productivity improvement. It's a win for the customer like me because I don't wanna go have to do, waste any time for getting checks deposited. And it's a win for them because they are not um, having employees have to um, help me deposit a check. And so, I mean, that's, you know, the last 20, 30 years, that's been a big improvement in automation and that's helped improve service productivity. Okay, so that is it on um, some of the design tools that are available for looking at process strategies. Uh, we've gone over uh, flowcharts, time function maps, value stream maps, uh, talked a little bit about uh, service uh, design and service productivity and how we can improve service productivity. So that concludes this video. Thanks.